Love and Light. This is Healthy Talk Show for Thursday, October 17th, 2019. I'm Robert. And I'm Marissa. HealthyTalkShow.com slash support if you want to help financially produce the show. Our show is value for value, so if you find value in our contents, please provide some back. HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. Show notes for this episode with links of everything we talk about are located over at HealthyTalkShow.com forward slash 25. On this episode of Healthy Talk Show, we have a weed cafe and crackdowns, pink tax, and a sperm lawsuit. But first... Starting today, consumers in the Kansas City, Pittsburgh, and Vero Beach, Florida areas can sign up to have Walmart deliver groceries directly into your fridge at home. So the pricing, technology details, and the official launch... Yeah, well, <laughs> that's just to reiterate, because I, I had to replay that one. Walmart delivering groceries directly into your home. Oh, man. Directly. Uh, how is this going to work? ...being announced for the first time today after the program itself was announced with generalities in June. So shoppers in eligible areas will need to buy either a smart lock kit for the door of the garage, which is $49.95, and installation is included in that price. Then you do pay $19.95 a month. It's a membership fee for unlimited delivery as long as you get a $30 purchase. That $49.95, though, is really cheap. If you consider the labor and how you have to get that workforce out there to install yeah. those locks and do all that installation, that's incredible. That's amazing. <laughs> well, bucks. you know the first thing that came to my mind, but let's finish the clip. <laughs> now, Walmart employees with at least a year of service that are background checked and trained will get a one-time access code that works only during the delivery window and only if a camera attached to the associate's uniform is live streaming and recording the delivery. <laughs> I don't it. know. That's Oh, uh, there's a lot wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it so cheap? Seems like Walmart. Yeah, it's just a it seems like a data collection thing now. That you're, but then that, you're going to have that's employees. The first thing that I thought of. You have th- probably unhappy employees sometimes in your house. Yeah. I don't care if they're live streaming. They're still Oh, that is weird. But usually these delivery employees are uh, contractors too or well these are going to be walmart employees they're very they have i went through the oh. research on this they they're going to well, do that, little profiles it's going to be little oh yeah you have but, to have been at least a year they're going to have little body cameras after you streaming still, the delivery. i don't know we're in all this data and mm-hmm. where is it going of course and man, i don't know but check this out check out this, this the the anchor on the news just how elitist he is if you're not there, see, yeah. I'm okay with it if I wasn't home. Yeah. So if it's, I was home, it would be more complicated for me. Well, if you were home, why would you need somebody to carry the groceries in and put them in the refrigerator Have for you ever you? seen me before? <laughs> <laughs> people you do it. Me before? Yes, people do, do a lot of things. <laughs> Have we, they say that's so funny. Dang. Because he yeah. did ask a really dumb question, but it just speaks to his mentality. I don't drink in my own groceries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ever. Well, I guess you have to think of who this is catered to. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Walmart catering to rich people yeah that's kind of ironic isn't it yeah (laughs) a little bit (laughs) remember when oprah acted like she never heard of walmart before no i don't i don't i don't (laughs) follow oprah too much okay does anyone else ask (laughs) healthytalkshow.com let me know send me a link to a clip we'll play it california did a few things over the weekend apparently I've got some clips. First one, fur ban. The state will soon become the first in the nation to ban the sale and manufacture of new fur products. The new law goes into effect in 2023. Governor Gavin Newsom also signed a new law barring most animals from circus performances. (laughs) What do you think? Yeah, it seems like a lot of virtue signaling. (laughs) I, I think I read that fur... Products for only one percent of the market. So, oh wow! So yeah, it's just, what, was it really necessary? Yeah. But yay! But okay, comparing <laughs> the longevity of the fake oh, furs to the real furs. That's true. You actually bring up a really interesting point because people take care of these furs and they pass them down through the generations. And actually, some people argue that the synthetic uh, furs are worse because they're made out of petroleum, so carbon based, and everyone's all anti-carbon these yeah. days. Not going to go there. But, Don't go there. But then people also get rid of them because they're very disposable. You just, just buy another one. It's not real. Yeah, and it's cheap. Yeah. So that's a, another interesting thing to think about, I guess. Yeah. 
lunch shaming ban in California. Good morning, Sheba. In the words of Governor Gavin Newsom, no more lunch shaming in California. The state banning the practice of lunch shaming, which is when a student owes school money, owes meal money to the school, and instead is de either denied lunch or given an alternative lunch instead. So going forward, the state will not be allowed to do that. California will guarantee all students a state-funded meal of their choice, regardless of whether their parent or guardian has unpaid meal fees. Fees. The law, in part, prompted by the third grader you mentioned, Shiva, who paid for all the food bills of his fellow students at a Napa Elementary School. And we've been following. Yep, I left that little story out just for expedience. <laughs> Interesting. What was your opinion? Uh, you kids have to eat food. <laughs> <laughs> you got to take care of the kids. And you know, it's yeah. It's we don't like you know. It's going to cost a lot of money, but kids have to eat. I know it's That's the problem. It's a problem. Yeah. It's it's interesting. I remember the lunch shaming as a kid. Yeah, do you? Yeah, the, you know, the student, they forgot their lunch money. Mm -hmm. Or I guess we were little kids. And then you have to eat the, the reject peanut butter sandwiches. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah <laughs> I guess that yeah, was yeah. kind of jacked up. That's pretty jacked up. <laughs> yeah, because it usually resulted in some kid crying. <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't. <laughs> kids should not have to go through that. Yeah. That's not. Okay, moving on. Still California. Overnight, the state of California giving students a late pass, becoming the first state in the country to mandate later start times at most public schools. The proposed legislation signed into law by Governor Gavin Newsom on Sunday designed to help students by giving them more sleep. The law requiring middle schools to begin Wait. classes at 8 a.m. or later. Wait, I'm sorry. Oh, How does that get you more sleep? It just alters when you sleep, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the same argument I say about daylight savings and farmers. People always say farmers. Like, farmers can wake up whenever the yeah. sun comes up. Their schedule they're, they're can be... Self yeah, their schedule is dependent on the sun. So, yeah. But why should our schedules be dependent on their schedules? Yeah, I, I see your point. Very good, very good. All right. Very good. Sorry, continue. <laughs> it's while high schools will start no earlier than 8.30 a.m. The reason, according to some studies, later start times mean more sleep, leading to better health and school performance among adolescents. The students who start school later have decreased rates of depression, they have higher test scores, there's less car accidents in the community because they're, they're driving um, less drowsy. According to the National Sleep Foundation, teenagers need eight to 10 hours of sleep a night, but only about 15% get that much. Much. The average amount, less than seven hours a night. Why is that? I'm curious. Is it because they're starting school early or is it because they're losing sleep because they're looking at their phones or too well, much homework? I, I would remember when I was in school, I would only get four hours of sleep sometime because of homework. So let, let's see what they're saying. Yeah. Or the heavy backpack. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. I don't know. Because it's. Through the report, and a lot of pushback on this is daycare. Now, some mm. single parents before and after school daycare, depending on their work schedules, after school activities, pushes yeah. everything back during the day. That's true. So they, they're they going to be staying up later yeah, than so they you're already not, are. At the same time, starting waking, kids waking up at five o'clock, that's not good. Yeah, cool. well. That's bad for the brain. That's that's true. I mean, some people have argued that teenagers, they, they do need to sleep later or mm -hmm. But, for the developing brain especially. Yeah, but that doesn't address all the after school activities like you just said. Yeah. So I remember I did band after school. Yeah. A lot of things. You, yeah. you know, band athletics. Yeah. Dang. Hmm. Smoking weed. <laughs> whoa. Whoa, hey. Whoa. Whoa. I did not do that. Still in, school. in California, anti bullying laws. Well, the new laws come after one Southern California school witnessed two acts of violence, and one of them leaving a 13 year old boy dead. And concerns a 10 year old student at another school might have died by suicide over being bullied. The question now do these new laws go far enough? <laughs> that should never be the question with the law. Does it go far enough? Oh. The heck? You should be asking the other question. Yeah, I, that's what. Students sucker punched in this video last month. Diego Stoltz died of his injuries a week later. And on Monday, there was another attack at the same school. Jeez. 
Yeah. Time to punch my daughter in the face nine times. Now, police are investigating whether 10-year-old Allison Wendell, who attended this Southern California elementary school, died by suicide last weekend. Police have been scouring her social media and following leads at her school that she might have been bullied. We want people to remember her, like, who she was, not think that she was a sad little girl that was in some, you know, horrible depression because that wasn't the truth. Rise Up Against Bullying is a school violence program based in Southern California. Karina Gonzalez is a counselor there. Now you have students that are bullied at school and then it carries over at home because the bully continues online. The okay. Wait, how? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 they're just, they're saying the words and they're not even hearing themselves. Yeah. Speak. How does the bullying continue online? How? Yeah. Who controls the internet yes, access? Where is there's a problem? <laughs> Who's I, controlling the phone access? <laughs> online threat is addressed as part of three sweeping new anti-bullying laws signed by California Governor Gavin Newsom over the past month. The Safe Place to Learn Act requires that children in kindergarten through sixth grade have easy access to suicide prevention Jeez. materials, including on the Internet. Meanwhile, an amendment to the state's education code is also aimed at younger students, requiring an updated policy on suicide prevention appropriate to the needs to those at high risk, including youngsters who are disabled, homeless, or identify as gay, lesbian, or transgender. Another law creates a special suicide prevention fund for taxpayer contributions. It would help fund crisis centers that are active what members it, of the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. That's a lot. What, that's a what's lot. more money going to do? And this just came across my desk today, so I have not had time to even. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. Oh. But it, it kind of reminds me of the D.A.R.E. program, mm. where the argument was it was an over saturation of information or something to do with drugs that didn't actually help anything because it just yeah it's not the way to stop kids from using drugs <laughs> yeah i'm i'm really curious to how they're gonna appro approach the subject of suicide with really young kids yeah because that seems well it puts a lot on teachers too so now yeah. the mental health of its children is the responsibility of the schools now responsibility of the underpaid teachers who are already That's... underpaid who are already striking and now we're putting the mental health of our children in their hands no the mental health of our children need to be in the parents hands i'm sorry that's yeah it has to be that way it... we don't have the re the t again the t no the... you're you're right sorry no i was gonna and we're not looking at the <laughs> other systemic issues here like why are so many people depressed? Throwing yes. more money into it is not solving it. We need to look at why are people so depressed? Mm -hmm. And people have brought and up the cell phones. Yes. And and they said that they that that's why. Okay. Well, let's listen to the closing. <laughs> Well, nationwide, about 20% of students <coughs> aged 12 to 18 say they've been bullied. And experts say because of the Internet, students are often unable to escape their bullies. Why? Why? How? What? Did the, the internet, you can turn it off. Yeah. You can filter it. You can fil You can turn it off. <laughs> turn what? off your phones. Oh, my. This is sucks. And are constantly being re-traumatized. Yes. Tony? Yeah, it's a sad reality. Carter, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, it's a good reminder to have a conversation as a parent with your kids yep. about yes. this predicament. It's um, the scary part because now it's literally, <laughs> the bullying is literally coming into the home through the computer. <laughs> Oh, it's coming into the computer. How do we stop it? You know, when we were little, it ended at the schoolyard. Yeah, that's right. And then you could yes. go home, and that was sort of your sanction. Yes. That is no longer the yeah, case. It but it, is, it still could be the case. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Our home is not a sanctuary. <sighs> Whose fault is that? Yes. If your home is not a sanctuary. Yeah, Reevaluate. Kick the freaking Amazon devices yeah. and the Google devices out of your house. Kick the screens out of your house. And, and what happened to having the family computer, remember, that was supposed to be monitored at all times yeah, by the parent? Yeah, in the living room. Yeah, that was always what they would say. Now that's everyone's... Gone. Everybody has a computer in their pocket. Yeah, and that's not good because now who knows what the heck they're looking at. Yep. All right. Switching gears... Well, it's estimated every year women in the state of Ohio pay $4 million in taxes for these things, tampons and pads. Now, some state lawmakers say because they are medically necessary that that shouldn't be the case. When women leave the store, it's not uncommon they have something men will never buy. 
tampons or pads, which both come with a tax. According to the Legislative Service Commission, Ohio women pay nearly $4 million in annual taxes on feminine hygiene. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it's shocking. But that could change. Thursday, the House passed Senate Bill 26. It's intended to provide a tax credit for teachers buying school supplies. Folded into it is language to repeal sales tax on feminine hygiene products. Some people think it's just a sales tax. Cincinnati Representative Brigid Kelly sponsored the provision. In a statement, she said, we are making medically necessary products more accessible to women and girls in our state. Now next, this bill will go to the Senate if it reaches approval there. It'll go to the governor's office to be signed. Reporting in Cincinnati, Marielle Carbo, 9 on your side. In Cincinnati from a Target, from the looks of things. <laughs> ah, Target. <laughs> Advertisement. <laughs> 10 states that have eliminated the tampon tax so far. Minnesota, Illinois, Florida, Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> and Nevada. Oregon, Montana, Alaska, Delaware, and New Hampshire don't tax menstrual products because they don't have general sales tax. And they have freedom, <laughs> <laughs> at least from sales tax. Yeah. Well, I I think it's a good thing. <laughs> it's interesting it's, because it's interesting. it made me it caused me to dive into this a little bit. So in the United States, the argument right now is to repeal the sales tax on feminine hygiene products, which is completely acceptable. And I think we 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 kind of delved through into the argument a little bit and the argument. You know, where do we draw the line and what? Yeah. What, what. But okay, well. For in Europe, they're trying to get schools to provide sanitary products, which I'm on board for. I think schools should provide them because you know why not? If let's watch. <laughs> Period poverty. There are approximately four billion women in the world today, and around half menstruate, with many struggling to afford even the most basic sanitary wear. From the outset, you might assume that women affected are mostly in countries with less developed economies. And to an extent, that's true. But being unable to afford sanitary products, period poverty as it's called, affects women everywhere. Take the UK for example. It's the world's fifth largest economy. But despite its wealth, 10% of girls and young women in the country have been unable to afford sanitary products at some point. That's according to a survey by Plan International UK. Four in ten have used toilet paper because they struggled to afford pads and tampons. And it's not... That is rough. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah. That's, that sucks. Something that many people are willing to talk about. Almost half of girls and young women say they're embarrassed by their periods. I have a really good argument for this. I like developing arguments for things where people can't argue. So if you have an argument against my argument, then please email <laughs> askhealthytalkshow.com. But they should be provided to these, especially in schools, because if they're not provided, will that cause a disturbance to the other students in the class? That's, That's the best way to look at it. Not even looking at it from, you know, it's just, it's not their, you know, they should just, it should be provided because they can't control it. It's all this thing. It's natural, all that. But yeah. Not even true. diving into that. Just that's the ironclad. <laughs> you can't argue against that? Yeah. What do you think? I, I agree. Especially uh, middle schoolers. Yeah. But they're <laughs> not, well, let's look at what the government's doing. Cause they're, you know. Layla Moran is a British See. member of Parliament. <clears throat> And here she is back in 2017, calling for the government to provide free period products for schoolgirls who need them. Focus on the small issue. Schools should stock sanitary products for those who need them. Such a small, simple step would restore dignity, save embarrassment, and reduce the numbers of girls missing valuable days of teaching and learning. Although that's not something supported by the British government. What is important is to find out about school absence, to find out how many children are not buying sanitary protection um, because they feel too poor to do so. And only then can we think about possible solutions. Why? <laughs> yeah, let's, if there's already a problem, it's already yeah. been identified. <laughs> Why? Let's Why? just keep looking at the problem. Why again. beat around the bush? Hmm. But, but that is a very good point. I, I forget that some people miss school because they can't yeah. afford oh, yeah. products. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Finishing off this clip. Scotland has taken the lead, setting aside almost 7 million to make sanitary products free for pupils at schools, colleges, and universities across the country. Wales has set aside more than 1 million for the same thing. But they're among very few countries to have taken action. Millions of women and girls globally still struggle to access the sanitary products they need. 
sucks. Yeah. What happened to the the free bleed movement? The free bleed. Yeah, (laughs) it's not. Where where are the free bleeders? Nobody wants to do that. Yeah, that's true. Too distracting. The fact that condoms are provided at colleges speaks to sexism because you don't need a condom Um, to show up to class and learn. It's extracurricular activity. I see sanitary products at some colleges, but actually, I don't know about... We gotta, we gotta investigate. Yeah, we gotta do some research. Let us know. Does right. your college provide sanitary products? Uh, Skillthytalkshow.com. CBS This Morning. Breast cancer in men. Well, Anthony, statistically speaking, it's not that common. About 500 men will die this year from breast cancer, compared to more than 41,000 women. But the mortality rate in men is higher. And in the case of Tammy Porter, she says the lack of awareness around the disease caused a delay in her late husband's diagnosis. It never even occurred to me uh, that he would, uh, any type of cancer, certainly not breast cancer. Four years ago, Tammy Porter's husband, Mike, first started noticing symptoms of breast cancer. He literally had a pea-sized lump under his areola on his left side, and he pointed it out to me one day, just kind of -of matter-of-factly, and I said, oh, that's interesting. And, you know, there was no discussion of it ever at all until probably three to four months later, and he said, I think this is getting bigger. And at that time, it was much closer to a dime size, and his nipple was inverting, and I could tell that there was some growth there. After a visit to their physician, Mike was quickly scheduled for a mammogram. What did Mike think about the mammogram discussion? He, I think he was embarrassed a little. It was really hard for him to mention the words breast cancer. He would say, I have cancer, but it was hard for him to actually discuss the the breast cancer part. You know, it was very ostracizing walking into a clinic that's full of pink and, you know, the mammogram room that literally says women only. He underwent a radical... Interesting. Wow. That's... Yeah, weird. that's that's really sad. Yeah. I never realized that. Such a small number of men. I know. ...mastectomy and radiation, but the cancer metastasized to his lungs, spine, and brain. Two and a half years after diagnosis, Mike passed away. If we had known three or four months prior, you know, it may have been a stage one diagnosis. It was an aggressive cancer, and so it might have been very different had we known. Dang. Oh. Yeah, the main message is men can get breast cancer. Yeah. And men have to be aware of that. Check yourselves. That's right. So now you can do uh, breast exams on each other. <laughs> yeah, we got a doctor here. General men have lower survival rates than women do after they get diagnosed with breast cancer. One third of Dr. Sharon Giordano's patients are men, and she says men often get diagnosed with more advanced breast cancer in part because of lack of education. Some of the risk factors in men include genetic factors such as BRCA mutations, um, exposure to radiation therapy in the past, a family history of breast cancer. So if they have a first degree relative who's had breast cancer, they have more than double the risk of having breast cancer themselves. Stay aware. Yep. We actually have FDA recommendations, FDA I think. recently Bam. put out guidance recommending men be included in breast cancer clinical trials. It's typically only women participating in these trials. And for men, the symptoms are usually a lump behind the nipple or some bleeding. Wow. It's so interesting that early detection in, in men is especially critical. Yes, because yeah. most men pick it up at a later stage. And yeah. at that point, it's metastasized and the survival rate is much lower. Mm-hmm. But love, if it's picked up early, the survival rate's equivalent to that of women. I love Dombrowski's uh, basically infomercial for, for this. It's like, bro, you got breasts. You got breasts, you know? yeah. It yeah. can happen to you, too. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. We were talking about, because there was an athlete that had breast cancer, and he's uh, running a campaign. I clipped that all that out. It was cool. Check it out. CBS This Morning. Cool. Yep. Have anything else? All right, CBS Man Slams Fertility Clinic. 30 years ago, Cleary was a medical student at Oregon Health and Science University. He was recruited by the school's fertility clinic to donate sperm for infertile couples and research programs. Wednesday, he filed a lawsuit for more than $5 million against the university. In the suit, Cleary says he was promised that all fertilizations would be limited to women not residing anywhere near the state of Oregon and the Pacific Northwest, and no more than five children would be born of a donor's sperm. I don't know if it was written down. I know it was promised. Well, then you don't have a case, my friend. Yeah. You don't have a case if it's... 
It's a little off. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know it was written down. Yeah, if, it's, if you don't know it's written down, it probably wasn't. That's just you saying you know it wasn't written <laughs> down, so you're probably lying. <laughs> Think that, about it. Now. That's okay. Let's, let's continue. In 2018, Cleary registered with Ancestry.com. He was shocked to learn he had at least 17 offspring. Holy wait, moly. wait. That many people use Ancestry.com? Yeah. That many people use Ancestry.com. <laughs> I don't know which is more shocking. <laughs> 17 kids? Yep. <laughs> 17. <laughs> or that they were all on there. Yeah. How many more are there, well, statistically uh, speaking? Well, well. Born in the Northwest, <laughs> including 25-year-old one of them. Allison Ali. Awkward. Awkward. And then we have some legal... Sperm banking in America is big business. Dove Fox is author of Birth Rights and Wrongs, How Medicine and Technology Are Remaking Reproduction and the Law. There's no meaningful regulation on uh -oh. this $6 billion industry. So $6 billion industry and, and regulation. He, yeah, he just yep. said the R word. Yep, yep. So sperm banks uh, don't keep track of how many people are created from any particular donor. It's hard to be all that surprised when mishaps take place. In a statement, OHSU says it treats any allegation of misconduct with the gravity it deserves. Nice. In light of our patient <laughs> privacy obligations and the confidentiality of protected health information, we cannot comment on this case. <laughs> so, I have another issue with this. Okay. But it seems like they've created this problem. Yep. That now they they weren't, you know, seeing how many people they've been making children with and now, now they're, they're running gonna... around. And so and and now they're gonna say, Oh, well now you have to get t tested. Tested before and we you might need regulation. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Interesting. Very interesting. Can't pull a fast one healthy talk show. Yeah. We're on the case. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> you good? Yeah. All right, so you want to go to my favorite topic, marijuana? Let's do it. Good morning, America. Talking about the weed. Very interesting study, Amy. It was done at a Boston University. They followed over 1,400 couples before they conceived and then controlled for all other factors. And as you said, what they found is if the man smoked pot once or more a week, his the woman was twice as likely to suffer a miscarriage. Now, the caveats, this study was done by association, not cause and effect, so it definitely needs more research. And there is not yet peer-reviewed data here, but this abstract okay. did yeah. win a prize at the- It won a prize. Reproductive yeah. Event. It won a prize. Well, it won my, my first a issue, she was talking, oh, they, they controlled for all the factors. They ruled out everything. Oh, but no one's actually looked at the data. So we try to look for the data. And there is no data. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not no data published yet. I can't even find the video of them talking about the... Yeah, and, and they do say that they're going to submit it, but Let's it's see hard to comment. <laughs> this in meeting in the world that's going on today, so it's getting a lot of yeah, attention. Yeah, and it's something that couples should pay attention to at the very least. Yeah. We're trying to conceive right now, and the study obviously focused on men's behavior. Right. So... What can couples do to improve their fertility? Well, I think that's situation. part of the reason why this study is getting so much attention because we're used to putting all the focus, all the blame, all the stress on the woman, and the world of male fertility is really exploding. So I think there are some basic recommendations that women can do, number uh, that men can do. Number one, Ooh. no smoking. <laughs> that's bad for both the man and the woman. They want to minimize exposure to high temperatures. Don't overdo alcohol. That's important for general health and exercising regularly. And again, 40% of couples' infertility is due to male factors. So it bears repeating. We need to focus on the men just as much yeah. as the women. And more studies. <sighs> I have to take issue with this. Uh -huh. Now that I'm watching this clip, I actually was okay with it because I'm saying, oh, you know, it's a study, whatever. Yeah. But the recommendations at the end of this clip, no smoking, but you could have alcohol. <sighs> Well, I, I no smoking marijuana. I'm you know, assuming. actually, I'm, I took that as no smoking uh, cigs. Oh, because those are the always the general guidelines of how to improve yeah. fertility. Yeah, Just yeah. the generic. But you they're know. talking about weed. I'm, that's why. Well, I'm confused. they, oh, are, that's they already I'm... shifted, and then they're just giving the generic spiel. Just, uh... And my other issue. Okay. So we, we talked about it actually previously on Healthy Talk Show. I think. Y yes. How uh, exposure to cannabis. Uh, increased sperm count and then there there was another study too so yeah so that was one study that was higher sperm count and then the yeah. other one that you referred to uh linked marijuana smoking to altering the genetic profile of sperm 
but it was a very small study and they didn't know uh, how that affected the DNA of the child. So there's still a lot of questions. Yeah. And honestly, it feels like a lot of people are trying to rush out this marijuana research because, I mean, there is a huge gap in the field. Don't get me oh, wrong. Oh, yeah, huge. And, and we all know why. Yeah. But now they're just rushing out these studies and saying things left and right, but no one's really studied it But okay, that well. So that's we, true. It has not been studied in a lab. But how many hippies... How long has weed been consumed well, in history? Yeah, that's the other. You can look at that. Yeah. So you can we can look at that just yeah. looking at, you know, I see a lot it, of functional Well, well, I, I I see a lot of smoker people that smoke tons of weed that reproduce like freaking rabbits. Uh, uh, uh. Okay? No, I Well, well that's the other thing. It there's so many other factors and people's bodies are different mm-hmm. and I noticed that it seemed like they're trying to blame weed for this increase because they're saying oh yeah since the 70s fertility's yeah. been on the decline but there are so many other factors and they pollution they, yeah pollution <laughs> fire retardants many chemicals can affect fertility yeah so w- w- there are so many factors that we don't understand <laughs> all right so, yep sorry so rant <laughs> we're looking for the research if we yeah. can get our hands on it we are going to look at it yeah if you know other good stories Ask or doctor. how to stay fertile. Any tips? How to stay Let fertile. us know. AskHealthyTalkShow.com. Is there a plant we can consume or something? You know. <laughs> All right. Staying on the weed track. Oops. Got to queue up this video. Sorry. Who is that? CBS. What's in your CBD? It took two days for senior lab assistant Joshua Kogel to test our nine samples. Checking for CBD and for THC, the ingredient in marijuana that gives a high. And also for dangerous impurities like pesticides and heavy metals. So my high labs, we test for four different heavy metals, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, and lead. The four- They all sound bad. They (laughs) are very, yes, things you do not want in your body. The CBD craze took off when President Trump signed the Farm Bill last December. The bill allows farmers to legally grow hemp, the source of CBD. It is a member of the marijuana plant family, but it produces only trace amounts of THC. Under the bill, the government allows less than 0.3% THC in CBD products. Here's what Mile High found in our samples. None had pesticides or heavy metals above federal standards. That's good. Yeah, That's... Why, why were they so dramatic about it? All right, good. the way he read it. Oh. Well, he's, he's, he's a news reader. He's dramatic. Sorry, he's has sorry. To be, oh, I, have, I have results. No results. That's exactly <laughs> the how the in. report went. Yeah, no big deal. Yep. The THC levels were all within federal guidelines. <gasps> but when <gasps> okay. It came to dosages advertised is, on the label, uh, watch out. Four samples were pretty much right on. Two samples cheated you giving only 60 to 80% of the advertised Crooks. dosage. Then there were the overperformers. Yeah. The 1,000 well. milligram supply was really <laughs> 1,100, 10% higher. And Ooh. one was way over, 210%. Nice. Wow, someone gives you, wow, that's a great <laughs> I, deal. I know, let's buy from them. That's a great deal. Oh, uh. what the label said. This last sample claimed 500 milligrams in the bottle, and we measured 210%. In the Holy bottle. Mackerel. Yeah. Holy so, mackerel. I like that you kept that in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you should start saying that. Holy mackerel. Holy mackerel. Let me see if I can get that one more time. And we measured 210% in the Holy bottle. Holy mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're gonna have to make that an uh, ISO. But, so. <laughs> but in all seriousness, that is kind of, you know, that, it's a lot. That's a huge, that's, that's, that's true. FUD. That is messed up. But. It also, the CBD is, well, let's see. Let's see what happens when you take too much CBD. We went to the emergency room at UC Health, University of Colorado Hospital. We know that it has some medical benefits. Where I met Dr. Andrew Monte, a toxicologist and emergency medicine physician who has treated people who ingested too much CBD. Patients actually can become more somnolent than uh, would be expected, right? So they can become very sleepy. Um, Patients can also get nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Those are the most common side effects from oral CBD. Oh, okay, so nobody's going to die from it, so it's not that big of a deal. (laughs) You're just going to take a nap? (laughs) You're going to take a nap or not feel too well. (laughs) 
I guess get to know who is making your CBD. Moving on, Cannabis Cafe. Welcome to the Lowell Cafe, America's first marijuana restaurant, where they serve traditional comfort food with a side order of pot in all its form. Drummer teamed up with organic cannabis supplier Lowell Herb Company. Together, they lobbied the city of West Hollywood to license businesses that allow marijuana consumption. Would you say that West Hollywood has rolled out the welcome mat for businesses like this? 100%. John Leonard works for the city. Our county- yeah, well, 100%. Huh? Yeah. yeah, we've rolled out the red carpet. Come <laughs> on in. You know, Give us your money. Some money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> didn't want to have a lottery or a first come first serve they wanted to be merit-based approach the lowell cafe is the first of 16 spots that will allow smoking and vaping or edibles businesses that could draw tourists and pump up to seven million tax dollars into the city how do you make sure that people aren't getting behind the wheel you know the way we're doing it is the businesses are really kind of in control. When you first sit down, they ask what your level of experience is with smoking cannabis or ingesting cannabis, and they kind of walk you through that process based on your tolerance. <laughs> yeah, I know. They're going to certainly help you get an Uber or Lyft ride. Right, what would happen if you were to rock up rock? Yeah, but, well, you know, we just moved from <laughs> Southern California, so I'm really upset that I don't yeah. even get to try this. <laughs> Not that we could have ever applied. Yeah, I know it looks hipster. The menu is super hipster. Everything super <laughs> looks really expensive. Yeah, how much uh, does a joint cost? I have no idea. I don't even know if I have the price in the report, <laughs> but I did cut out this cool thing about the design. It's just a beautiful. Just like, to show you how hipster it is. Comes here, and that's what I love about it. Design team Mark and Johnny Houston, yeah. the brains that behind is fancy. a dozen LA nightclubs and bars, had to fuse function with their vision. Take the air filtration system, which by code had to keep aromas from floating onto city streets. What? To me, when I looked at it, I thought it was a bunch of Korean barbecue hoods, and I was like, no, I'm not doing that. I go, I have to redesign this to look a little bit more approachable and not heavy. And then all the growth of like the landscaping, everything that's gonna come over and take I'm over it. It's definitely not dark and dingy. It's welcoming. It's, <laughs> I think, surprising many. You're not hiding. Yeah, yeah we're, not, we're hiding. not hiding. We're out here and embracing everyone and letting them all know, hey, this is your home too. That sense of community was another attraction for the city, which like the Lowell Cafe's promise to pay employees generously and give opportunities to people who may have drug offenses. Rec- Seems cool. Yeah, I support that. Yeah, sounds great. I just, <laughs> I don't think I can afford it. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> And now, the bad news for all the weed heads out there. Oh, no. As more states legalize recreational weed, law enforcement is concerned that these terrifying and deadly scenes will become all too common across the U.S. How are you guys doing tonight? But that could change with the first ever marijuana breathalyzer, shown in this exclusive video provided to NBC News. Law enforcement testing the new breathalyzer out on the streets over Labor Day weekend. You're positive for the marijuana being in your lungs. Fingers yep. crossed. <laughs> there you go. Dr. Mike Lynn gave NBC News an exclusive first look at his patented device. A break. <laughs> for two minutes, you breathe into the device. One billion times more sensitive than an alcohol breathalyzer. Much like a dog's nose which inspired the company's name, Hound Labs. Your breath is collected in a cartridge for analysis, the process taking about 10 minutes. It's done. I passed. You passed. <laughs> no. Whoa, what a surprise. Yeah. The test was correct. I wasn't actually high. But what if I were? Warning. Wait, it's what? Objective data that says it's in your breath. You've used that it. doesn't yeah. tell me anything. Yeah, warning. It just randomly flashes war- high, warning. High, high, <laughs> THC, alert. <laughs> Whether you smoke, vape, or eat marijuana, authorities can currently test for pot using blood, urine, or hair samples, where it can remain for days, if not weeks. But there's no way to know if someone recently used cannabis unless you test their breath. That two to three hour period correlates to the peak impairment window that's been identified by the federal government and many other researchers. In other words, the time when you're high. The right? time when you're when you're most likely to be highest. We don't most likely any. most to likely to be highest. What what is that? The time Can when you're most quantify likely to be that? highest. Yeah. Well, he's I, just trying to know. quantify dollars into his bank account. Yeah, because I 
I believe a uh, blood alcohol content. That's something you can measure. Yeah. <laughs> in the cartridge. This new technology isn't cheap, but the company has raised $65 million. Ooh, Researchers yeah. and law enforcement think this new tool will help save lives. Maybe. <laughs> uh, I'm not... Where, where are the stats that talk about all these people that run around driving high? Oh, I got you. <laughs> Nearly 12,000 people drove while high in 2018. In Washington, 12,000 people drove while high. Holy crap. And then what happened? We got an epidemic here. We got an epidemic. And, yeah, 12,000 people drove high. Oh and, my gosh. The, the world is ending. Well, how many people drove drunk? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> or how many people, how many of these 12,000 people are dead from driving high? <laughs> we need more stats. Yeah. State 12% of all traffic deaths between 2008 and 2017 involved THC positive drivers. When and fatal crashes yeah, in Vermont linked exactly. to marijuana have skyrocketed by 173% since the state decriminalized weed in 2010. Tits. Again, how do you test for that? Because yep. they just said they just said you can't. It's really oh, hard, or that it stays in your it stays system, in your system for, for months. Long. Exactly. Uh, with the hair test. So, so are what you going to ask somebody? Hey, you driving high? No. <laughs> yes. And then, well, and after a crash, how do you measure that? Yeah. Other than the hair, but that's going to be a yeah. old level. Two more clips. A great question. As you think of a breathalyzer, which measures whether you're over or under the legal limit, right. is there a legal limit mm -hmm. for marijuana? Well, this does, she yeah. does she smoke weed? Is there? She's, she might smoke weed. Yeah, she probably smokes weed. She, that's why she's asking. She's really yeah. curious. This is part of the Let's hear the question again. You're over or under the legal limit. Right. Is there a legal limit mm -hmm. for marijuana? Well, this is part of the problem. The legal limit for alcohol is 0 0.08, mm -hmm. and that's based on lots of research. But there hasn't been lots of lots of research mm -hmm. on marijuana because it's illegal. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to figure out where to put that limit. That's a huge part of this, and they're going to have to do that soon. Too uh, long. Again, yeah, a good I luck. haven't seen any numbers. Yeah, there have been no numbers <laughs> floating around. He said the time, what the time? Yeah, the time you're most likely to be highest. Okay. All right. And then my <laughs> community service here, tips for people who want to drive high. Don't drive high. I'm just kidding. But seriously, it's kind of funny. So there's several indicators that we look for when looking for a DUI. Driving too slow, driving too fast, not reacting properly to the roadway. Or driving too slow, driving too fast, not reacting properly wait, to the roadway. Wait. So drive exactly the speed yeah. limit. <laughs> or the traffic conditions. Can someone who's driving under the influence of marijuana and THC be just as dangerous on the road as someone driving under the influence of alcohol? Absolutely. Some of my worst field sobriety tests were just marijuana only. Marijuana can impair and it does impair. <laughs> sure it does. Don't drive high though. Don't drive yeah. under the influence of anything really. <laughs> it's not the it's not the safest way to go. But really, if you deviate from any rules of the road, the cops will pull you yeah, over. Yeah, they're going to pull you That's, over either way. You can yeah. get pulled over for holding your cell phone. Yeah. So, just, yeah. Cops pull you over no matter what. That's true. So, if you're high and driving, just go the speed limit, apparently. Well, well I feel like the, most people that we know that get high, they end up just ordering food, you know, DoorDash and yeah. all those. It really does support the delivery services. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really, marijuana, it really does support local food yeah. industry and delivery. It does. It's really great for that. Uh, and now, crackdown on illegal dispensaries in California, ABC7. Complaints from residents in unincorporated East LA about illegal cannabis dispensaries led to this response from the LA County Sheriff's oh my God. Narcotics Unit. Oh, yeah. Uh, look at it. Hello. Are you, where, wait, are, wait. Where, are we in a war zone? Where, are, well, look are at we the war, he's wearing. Are we in a war zone or are we raiding a pot dispensary? Have they been to a pot dispensary? <laughs> there are two dispensaries. They're serving warrants at because they've shut down these locations. Oh my, look before. at that giant tool he has. 300 identified illegal dispensaries in unincorporated LA County. Uh, we have closed. No. I know. <laughs> uh, it's painful. It's painful. It's painful. <laughs> Let me smoke it. I'll smoke it. It's, I'll smoke it. I'll take all that. That's fine. There's only 140 of them. They yeah, you know he's going to go smoke it later. And that's yep. just yeah. one part of the county. The outside of this illicit shop reads Genesis Flowers. That's pretty funny. But they sell a <laughs> different <laughs> type of bud. One that hasn't been tested and could get you sick. Oh my when gosh. When you take this off the market, this black market marijuana, it could save a life. 
the what? THC levels and some of the stuff that kids could get a hold of. Something this illegal oh dispensary my. had that the yeah. LA County Sheriff... That, that's a weak argument. Why? I understand the pesticide <laughs> argument, but her saying the THC levels and stuff, you, you'll die. <laughs> what? But, yeah, it's you'll get and, really high. And I I don't like the children argument. Oh, it's it's always the yeah. children. Keep your stuff away from your kids. That's important. Sheriff's department says they don't always find when serving search warrants at illegal dispensaries a grow room. It's a badass dispensary. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of dispensary you want to buy from, the one that grows their own stuff realistically. Yeah. But no, 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 no. They have to be separate. Here's a study. A study by BDS Analytics projects the legal market is on track to reach $3.1 billion in 2019 sales. But the illegal market <laughs> will generate... That's what they're upset about. That makes sense. This year. Yeah, the illegal market is more than double. Legal, $3.1 billion. Illegal, $8.7 billion. And the mm. illegal market is more than that, probably, because they, they cannot track it. The illegal weed market in California has been going on forever, for a very long time. That's, That's why true. the weed in California is really good. Well, also <laughs> the climate and all that, but yeah. If you're a consumer and you can go somewhere and get a 40% less price for what they think is the same product, you're going to go there. California needs to do a better job of educating the consumers about the safety of their product. Oh my gosh. Cameron Wald is EVP of Project Cannabis, which operates four locations in the state. EVP, so Executive Vice President of Project Cannabis, and they operate four stores in the Los Angeles area. Okay, let's just make sure EVP, Executive Vice President. That's wait, a very wait, big wait. term. Very big term. Sorry, look, look at Job their, title. their, uh, oh, their, their little up. slogan. A little dab will do you. Ha, <laughs> will do you. A is, little dab will do you. Is that your philosophy? <laughs> uh, big dab will do you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, geez, they're trying yeah. to... <laughs> yeah, rip you off right there. <laughs> yeah, I know and their own grow operation in downtown LA with costly state-of-the-art technology to make sure their product is compliant with state regulation. So this company has a lot of money. What does that a mean? A lot of money. Compliant costly, with yeah. state-of-the-art equipment. What, what do you for weed, need? For growing what do you weed. Need? For growing weed. Yeah. I, I'm a chemist and I <laughs> do not understand. <laughs> Wald says the black market is thriving because only 20% of California cities allow cannabis dispensaries and the penalties are weak for operators. We're talking about people that are breaking the law. We have regulated cannabis. We should be so thankful. Let's go after these. Ah, oh, hold on. Two more seconds. Two more seconds. Two more seconds. The people right. that are, are throwing it in our face. This guy upsets me because he's big money pushing for regulation yeah. because they're only they're going to be the only ones that can afford to abide by the regulations uh, precisely and why does weed need to be regulated <sighs> just grow it yourself yep all the dabs and stuff it's they're really easy to make people make them very simply they're it's super easy it does not take a genius to make this stuff it's really easy to make well that's why they wanted to be regulated oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course regulated yeah yeah because then big companies can't profit yeah and here's a good job title for us to look into. Lori Ajax is the chief of the Bureau of Cannabis Control. And chief of the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Why does everything always have to be controlled? <laughs> chief of the Bureau. Chief of the Bureau of Cannabis Control. They just legalized weed two years yeah. ago. And they already have the chief of the Bureau for Cannabis Control. How did how did she get that job? <laughs> Smoke, I don't know. smoke a lot of weed, smoke, I don't know. Reports to <laughs> Governor Newsom. Her office has launched the WeedWise campaign, which recently held weed this wise. event in Long Beach to educate consumers and business owners about the industry. They've also cracked down on the app Weed Maps, which still lists the locations of many illegal dispensaries. A new bill, AB 97, allows the state to impose a $30,000 a day fine for non-licensed violations. According to the Bureau of Canada, Cannabis control, there's 874 licensed dispensaries after 21 months of legalization. An audit by the United Cannabis Business Association found there's nearly <laughs> 3,000 illegal dispensaries. What are there, 874 legal ones? Oops. In illegal dispensaries and delivery services in California. That is great. But why is that? Which part? Why is the illegal business so strong? Because regulated weed sucks Precisely. and it's expensive. Precisely. And we were, out of curiosity, we were looking into just the 
fees and licensing of trying to do weed related business here. Yeah, it's expensive. It's yeah, substantially it's more expensive than any other business. Yeah. I mean, this is a ridiculous bar- barrier to entry. So how what do they expect? Yeah. I I don't know. It's they want they just want big tobacco to come in and buy up Precisely. the weed companies and then just add poison to the shit and just keep poisoning people. Yep. That's what big tobacco is doing with the vape products. Let's look at the vape products. Precisely. Big tobacco's in the big let's let's regulate the vape. We're just gonna keep doing it over and over again, poisoning ourselves. We need to stand up and say, no fuck this. We can grow the weed ourselves in our backyard. HealthyDocShow.com slash support. That was some good yes. news here. A country I never thought I'd see the day. In Mexico, the Senate is slated to vote on legislation to legalize marijuana in the coming days. Woo-hoo! The bill's passage Mexico? would mark a major shift away from the U.S.-backed drug war in Mexico, which has killed tens of thousands of people since it began in 2006. This is Mexican Senator Ricardo Monreal, a member of the Mexican president Andres Manuel López Obrador's Morena Party. La eliminación prohibicionista en el país es bueno. Eliminating prohibition in the country is good. I think the possibility of regulating consumption, the cultivation, commercialization is a good thing. Also, heeding towards industrial use is also good. I think that Mexico is prepared to take on such a position, on such trajectory. There are voices like that of the president, who has said there should be a national consultation, which is under consideration, which is pending, and which is under discussion. Oh, I heard the R word, but... (laughs) Yeah, but weed penalties in Mexico right now are outrageous. Yeah, so that's good. So that's really good, and it could really help them. Didn't... They could take a jab at the cartels, hopefully. Yeah. It'll be interesting. Yep. Also, where can we get those sweet uh, weed mask things that they they all had in their walk? Yeah, that sweet hat there. Right there? Yeah. The weed hat? Yeah, we need to get you one of those. <laughs> oh, I'll wear it every day. I know. I'll wear it every day. It looks like it has little eye holes, too, so I can put my eyes in I right know. there. I was wearing my... Yeah, that is... Someone, all right. Someone send us one of those. Yeah, we need one. AskHealthyTalkShow.com. We'll send you our address. Please send us one. <laughs> all right. Last story. So this is part of Apple's safe browsing feature. So the past couple of... Yeah, let's do with Apple and Safari. FYI. Years, they've been sending some web browsing data, including IP addresses, to Tencent as part of this feature to warn users if a website is malicious. So they will check these addresses against a known list of problematic sites, which are managed by Tencent for users in China and Google for users outside of China. Now, privacy advocates say that Apple should have been more transparent about this before rolling it out to its millions of users and that theoretically this could erode users' privacies. Yes, not theoretically. It does erode. Yeah. What they were doing, just to explain, they were basically sending your IP address if you're using Safari web browser to Tencent in China, Google, wherever, just send it over. And we use a VPN to mask our IP address because your IP address is a very exposing factor to you. It reveals a lot of information about you. And Apple's just saying, hey, fuck you, China, here you go. You can tell you guys take that, you take that. Yeah, that's uh, worrisome. Talking about Apple in China. This really isn't anything new. They've also, of course, taken apps off of the App Store in China. But it takes some added significance against the backdrop of all the other criticism Apple has been facing when it comes to removing the Hong Kong mapping app, which Apple said could be used to target uh, individuals and policemen, which the app developer says is actually to help people who want to safely get through Hong Kong amid the protests. Yes, and that was an issue because... Apple pulled this app down originally because China said, take this app down. Apple said, okay. They put it back up because people said, why are you taking it down? Because the protesters are using this to stay safe in the Hong Kong, whatever's going on over there. Apple takes it back down. So they take it down, put it up, and they take it back down. Oh, my god! So they're inconsistent because they're just... Well, they're... they're, Yeah. They're... They got China. They have Chinese influence. Yeah. And also recently removed the Taiwan flag from the emoji keyboard. So there's what? a lot of- Yeah, they removed the Taiwan flag from the emoji keyboard. That's really weird. Yeah. Politics wrapped into it where Apple trying to comply with local laws in China is viewed by outsiders, outside critics, as appeasing to the Chinese government. It's not. Wow. It's outside. No, it is what they're doing. Yeah. They're appeasing to the that Chinese government. really weird. If you're not following what's going on, you need to follow this with the NBA and all that with China and how they're controlling. They control a lot of media. They control a lot. They have a lot of influence and they're really shutting down, really silencing some voices here. And that's not... 
what we're about here in the United States, at least, I don't think. But let's listen with, with the NBA. What's going on with it's them? It's very simple, actually. Nike is in control of basketball. The NBA, college basketball, high school. Nike is the real person driving this conversation and this thing with China. If you go back to, and I'm connected to politics. In 2015, in May of 2015, President Barack Obama went to Nike's headquarters in Portland, Oregon, yes. and announced his defense of the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's right. Trade deal that was going to be very favorable for Nike, for China. Who's the president that came after Obama and walked America away from the TPP? Donald Trump. Who is the shoe company that employs LeBron James, Colin Kaepernick, and these other athletes that smear Donald Trump as mm. racist? Mm. Who are the I people constantly mm. criticizing Donald Trump? NBA, Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich. The NBA answers to Nike. Nike's a $40 billion business. The NBA is an $8 billion business. President Obama, the basketball president, friendly relationship with the NBA, went to Nike's headquarters to announce his defense of the TPP. This thing is very simple. This is about money. This is about a president that won't cooperate with what Nike wants done. Nike is using the NBA and its leverage over the NBA to go after this guy because they disagree with him about his policies as it relates to trade in China. Very interesting. Oh, he, wow. So Nike is in what, what do you say, $80 billion some industry, some huge amount, yeah. more than the NBA in China. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that is was crazy. crazy. So Nike. Well, I, I didn't realize how much influence China had over Nike. Yeah. Well, here's Obama actually speaking in defense of the TPP at Nike headquarters at Beaverton, Oregon, back when he was president. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership that we're working on, it's, it's the biggest trade deal. May 25th, what was it? What did I say? May 8th, 2015. It's, it's the biggest trade deal that we're working on right now. It has to do with the Asia-Pacific region. And it reflects our values in ways that, frankly, some previous trade agreements did not. And what? Yeah. Well. It's the highest standard, most progressive trade deal in history. It's got strong, enforceable provisions for workers preventing things like child labor. It's got strong, enforceable provisions on the environment, helping us to do things that haven't been done before to, to prevent uh, wildlife trafficking or deforestation or dealing with our oceans. And these are enforceable in the agreement. And Nike operates in the Pacific region, so they understand the competitive pressures they're under. Nike has factories all around the world. And let's face it, Mark, I think, doesn't mind me saying it. That <laughs> CEO. You don't think he might be saying this. <laughs> but who, who, who competes with China? Who would be, a comp, who'd be in competition with China I'm, in manufacturing for Nike? I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm one, just brainstorming. Some of these countries, they don't have the standards for wages and no, labor conditions. They don't. They don't. What countries? That we have here. So when you look at a country like Vietnam, oh, <laughs> Vietnam, oh, where'd Vietnam come from? <laughs> Vietnam would actually, for the first time, have to raise its labor standards. It of course. It would have to set a minimum wage. Yeah. It would have to pass safe workplace laws to protect its workers. It would even have to protect workers. I think hmm. I'll end it there. Interesting. Yeah. If you don't want outside influence or you know last time what were we, you don't want corporate influence we had mcdonald's last episode we were talking about yeah that. that's true you gotta gotta support your independent media yeah so don't trust china china is asshole what's that one more time oh my gosh what's that? one more time i found this i found this one huh? one more time one more time that come on play me one more time donald trump don't trust china china is asshole Love it. All right. Well, help 
support your independent media and you can help support us by yep. going over to healthytalkshow.com slash support through your financial contribution lets us talk about things like this and ensures that we remain unbiased commercial free and helps us pay for things like living expenses like our rent it's going to be a cold winter here our show is value for value if you found value in this show please provide some back by visiting healthytalkshow.com slash support we record healthy talk show live on mondays and thursdays at 8 p.m pacific standard time that's 3 a.m utc come join the fun over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash live another way to provide value is feedback our email askhealthytalkshow.com call us 509-878-3229 and healthytalkshow.com forward slash social for all of our social media links love and light love and light